Robinson. He even went down the sideline and he's got Cass Decker bringing you UCLA football content all throughout the year for LA Football Network. What is up, Bruin Bible listeners? We have another advertisement for you. We are so lucky to be sponsored by the great people at Athletic Greens. Uh, I started taking Athletic Greens specifically because I was lacking energy, lacking focus throughout the day, and needed some special pick-me-up ingredients to make things happen in my life. Athletic Greens has done just that. I've become absolutely addicted to the process. It has over 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source ingredients, probiotics, adaptogens to make your life easier uh, by doing this during the day. I like to take it to start my mornings off. I like to do it before a workout. makes you feel energized, focused, and just have a lot more energy throughout the day than I typically expected. But right now, is the, it's the time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every single day. Uh, that's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. Uh, to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to be give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash LAFB. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash LAFB to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Athletic Greens, a game changer when it comes to your health and your focus and your mindset. Now to the Bruin Bible. What is up to a special Friday night edition of the Bruin Bible? Will Decker, your host, joined by your friend, my favorite, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Madman, back in the house. He has a busy schedule, but he's always making time for LAFB. We love him out here. Madman, I haven't seen you in a couple weeks. How have you been, brother? We missed you out in Arizona. Brother, so great to see you, hear your voice. I was so looking forward to being part of the family in in Arizona last week. Unfortunately, a, a couple of work emergencies came in. And as I was telling you offline, you know, I was part janitor, part zookeeper at work. You know, it's you're sort of mopping up the messes and cleaning up, you know, the, the, the bird cages and the lion cages of crap, you know? So you guys had a phenomenal week last week. I was not doing anything nearly as fun wishing to be with you guys, but I was so proud of all of you doing such a great job out there and and building such a lovely network. So thrilled to be back thriller and, and excited to be back on, on radio row, hopefully next year and for many years to come, but so happy to be back at home in the Bible, chatting with my main man, Will the Thrill, Double Decker. Man, well, it's a thrill to have you back. You were certainly missed during Super Bowl week. And, uh, you know, we got plenty of more good times to come. Radio Row next year, Madman, is in Las Vegas. I mean, that's going to be the party of all parties next year. So if you're going to have to miss one to make it to Vegas. No, 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 that one, I mean, you know, things could, the buildings can burn down. I'm not missing that one. So, you know. <laughs> Man, we're going to have a late night poker run right into Super Bowl parties. I mean, it's going to be a lot to deal with out there. And as the famous mantra says, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It's going to be a lot of fun out there. And for anyone watching the visual podcast, I am a little bit sick. I have an eye infection as well. We got to troop through it, man. Bruin Bible. This is a big, big time for the Bruins. I want to bring this up, Matt, man, because we have not yet talked about this topic. And I felt it was a great you know, topic for a podcast for the Bible itself. 24-7 came out with this article a week ago today uh, saying likely that Bill McGovern will not be UCLA's defensive coordinator moving forward. An article from Tracy Pearson of 24-7 Sports. That got the wheels turning in my mind a little bit. Who could be a potential replacement for UCLA for a program that, for all intents and purposes, Martin Jarman has really elevated the stock of the athletic you know, uh, programs as a whole, you know? We're moving to the Big Ten. We're moving to a superior conference that comes with more media rights. We move to Jordan Brand, a much more appealing, you know, sporting official to have as opposed to the likes of Under Armour and things of that nature. He got us out of that deal and pretty much out of debt with the deal going to Big Ten. So 
Martin Jarman dreams big. And I think one of the big stipulations with Chip Kelly coming and returning to Westwood was, hey, I'm going to give you free reign on your guys. You know, when it comes to the defensive staff, as an arrow cannot be here next year. However, if you choose at McGovern, we're going to have to have a little bit of, you know, discussion as to what that's going to look like going to the Big Ten. McGovern has some health issues, and, you know, it's no secret moving forward. But this is a perfect time to kind of break down some of the guys that are coming to the defensive coordinator spot. Madman, how excited should Bruin fans be knowing that the Achilles heel of the team might be fixed with a nice D coordinator hire? Yeah, Will, it's it's so interesting. And isn't it so UCLA in terms of their relationship with communication, the media, the last couple of years that we have some noise about Bill McGovern maybe stepping away. And then it's been quiet for a week. And so you're not sure whether it's going to happen. It's not going to happen. It may lean one direction. But it's just ironic to sort of point out that you're doing such a phenomenal job. We're, we're having a great discussion here on, on being proactive in the event that Bill McGovern would leave UCLA. But the fact that it's still in this gray area is very interesting. But I completely agree with you, Will. First of all, want to wish Bill McGovern the best, you yeah. know, beyond football. And obviously, health is something that is the most important thing in life. It's the most treasured thing in life. And it's something that everyone has the right to dignity and privacy about. And so the fact that we don't know, I'm perfectly okay with because it's a very personal thing. It's a very intimate thing. And it's the most important thing to a person. So all I want to say is Bill McGovern, the person, Bill McGovern, the father, the husband, the grandfather, you know, I just wish him all the best in his life, uh, whether it's on the field with UCLA next year or in his personal life moving forward and, and hope he really thrives wherever he is in that regard. Because obviously, whatever the health matter was, it was serious enough, Will, for him to miss uh, half of last season. And you could clearly see where that impacted the Bruins, right? The three losses all came second half. This team started 6-0, and had three losses in the final six to seven games of the year. And it came in those in-game adjustments at an individual player level. It came when you're trying to sort of break momentum. It came when you're trying to turn the tide in different games. So you can have a script. You can have a scheme, you can have a strategy at the start of the game, but so much of coaching is the ebb and flow of how you maneuver different situations, and that's where we really missed him deeply. So if, if, if McGovern is ready to go and healthy, I think he brings an element that Ozanero did not in terms of relatability to his players, in terms of being able to listen, and I think have that culture shift. And if he can't go 100%, then obviously it opens up the door of possibilities for UCLA. So to me, it's we either get 100% of Bill McGovern, which I think is an upgrade over this past year, as well as the years before with Ozanero, or we get a new voice because Bill McGovern's health has been compromised, which is also an upgrade. So either way, I think it's important for Bruin fans to sort of frame the conversation that I think we're going to get an upgrade, and that's really exciting. It is, and I'm glad you touched upon the health standpoint with McGovern. We obviously would not wish any bad against Bill McGovern. He was, for all you know purposes, a very solid defensive coordinator up until that Arizona State game where he you know disappeared due to health reasons. You mentioned the defense fell apart at the end of the year. That's where our secondary numbers really skyrocketed, where we got into the mid-hundreds when it came to those points. So this is a guy that, you know, when he was the coordinator – he was doing a very respectable job. You know, I think he did as well as he could against a Michael Penix Jr. in Washington. I think he did as well as he could against, you know, a Utah with Cam Rising and the familiarity of those offenses. So McGovern is a, a guy that will be missed, but if we can get that upgrade to maybe get to that level where we've always said, give Chip Kelly a top 50 defense, and this team is going to be off to the races. And I, I texted you some of the names of the, the guys we're going to talk about. We've got six coaches that I feel like have to be on the short list for UCLA in some capacity. Some of these are a wish list. Some of you guys are going to be commenting, you know, on YouTube going, hey, the likelihood of that happening may not happen. But, you know, I think for our sake, we have to consider these guys in terms of what Jarman and UCLA is moving forward with to put UCLA on more of a national brand when it comes to football. And Madman, the first guy I want to start with with you 
it's the, it's the two obvious guys. It's Clancy Pendergrass and Ken Norton Jr. I'm going to start with Clancy. Was a defensive assistant last year for the staff, and he has a very you know impressive resume. This guy was a five-year defensive coordinator in the NFL. He had multiple stops with the 49ers, the Cowboys, the Browns, and the Chiefs. And, you know, he has done really well in the past when you look at his tenure at Cal. But the, the problem I have with Clancy Pendergrass is when you look at the successes from a guy like Clancy, it has all been from a decade plus ago. His best seasons as a coordinator were with the Cal Bears up north when he had some very impressive runs. He is credited with developing Cam Jordan. You know, and I think from 2010 to 2011, he actually held Chip Kelly, uh, you know, to 15 points in a close win against Cal when they were averaging about 50 a game in the year they went to the national championship and lost to, a, uh, you know, to the Auburn Tigers that year. So this guy is a really good coach, you know, for a long time. We saw how he flamed out at USC with all the talent in the world. We saw what happened when he pretty much became the defensive coordinator when McGovern stepped aside. Give me your thoughts on Pendergrass, because I don't think I'm sold on him, but his name has to be mentioned as he was the interim defensive coordinator when McGovern left. Yeah, well, it's a great point. And you, you laid it out so eloquently there in terms of context. I treat Clancy Pendergrass as the way NFL teams treat a quarterback situation when they need a bridge quarterback to the guy that they actually want. And so... Clancy Pendergrass, to me, if UCLA went in that direction, I would think it would be a bridge for a year, maybe two years, until the Big Ten money came in. And then you had the op opportunity to sort of open up the budget and really go after someone of a higher echelon. So to me, it would be a matter of who's on the market, and we'll get into all of that good stuff, who is attainable, because let's not forget, uh, Will, that given the situation, right, we're still under that debt. We're getting out of it. And the, the Big Ten money hasn't come in yet. So this may be a situation where I would give Pentagrass a two-year contract, if anything, to, to sort of be that bridge into the Big Ten era. But I don't see Pentagrass as my long-term solution. And the big reason why is the successes, that ceiling is just not there with Pentagrass. And the successes with some stacked USC defenses in terms of individual talent in the mid to late 2010s in that Clay Helton regime, those teams just always underachieved on both sides of the ball. And more importantly, Will, my concern was how undisciplined they were defensively. That was a team that led the country three out of four years in terms of defensive penalties a game at north of eight. So when I don't see the discipline, I don't see maximizing elite talent. To me, that doesn't scream the greatest of coaches. Now, he had, he's a plethora of experience. He's very respected. He knows the conference very well. Having said all of that, I think it would be a bridge situation at best. And I think the Bruins could do a little bit better. Yes. And, you know, I think for everything you just said there, I agree with a lot of points. I like him as a voice in the room. I don't know if yep. I want him to be the voice in the yes, room. Yes. His voice is valuable, and I think that's where Clancy Pendergrass would be for me. I'd like to have him on as an assistant. I'd like to have his voice in the room. He's been in some you know, serious coaching situations, you know, Barry Switzer and the Cowboys. And, you know, he was the defensive coordinator on a team that went to the Super Bowl. But you look at the Arizona Cardinals stats, he was actually very good his first two years there when he got hired by Denny Green. In the last three years, they tanked off. That Cardinals team made the Super Bowl because Larry Fitzgerald had one of the craziest runs in the history of playoff football as we know it. So for me, I, I'm not a, a huge fan on Clancy Pendergrass, but I think the option will be there for UCLA as they're going to seriously consider what they already have in store. As I look at Chip, very similar to the way I look at Belichick, he has the guys that he trusts, you know, and whether the fan base likes it or not, he's going to go with those picks when it comes to coordinators. You know, for instance, with Belichick putting Matt Patricia as the offensive coordinator this past year because he trusts him. So Clancy Pendergrass, I would give a 20% chance at being our next defensive coordinator, just given how close he is to the program already and everything else. Next guy I got for you, Mad Matt, Ken Norton Jr., the UCLA legend, man, the former All-American. He's had a great tenure as a coach and is he has been even better as a position coach. I mean, you look at what this guy has done in the linebacking room. 
when it comes from college level at USC to the pros in Oakland and Seattle, you know, and he molded the Brian Cushing's, the Clay Matthews, the Ray Malugas at the college level, goes to the NFL. He's widely credited for, you know, developing Bobby Wagner, KJ Wright for the Seahawks. Oh, and while he was at the Raiders, don't forget, he was the guy that helped get Khalil Mack to defensive player of the year with the Raiders. So I love Ken Norton Jr., but I'm going to follow on a similar point to what I had about Clancy Pendergrass. Uh, Ken Norton Jr. is an elite, an elite position coach. But when you've been asked to do a little bit more than position coach, the results really have not aligned with what I would like to see as somebody for you know a defensive coordinator spot. None of his defenses finished in the top 15 from his three years in Oakland and his four years in Seattle. So that's seven years of track record that we've seen with him being the main guy as a defensive coordinator with them not finishing in these top, you know, 15 to 20 defenses. And they had talent with Seattle and Oakland there at the time. Not really my guy for defensive coordinator, but this is a guy you have to keep on staff any way possible. He's a Bruin. He can sell the program as well as anybody. And he's a phenomenal, phenomenal, maybe the top tier of a linebacking coach we have at both college and the NFL. We've seen it with John John Bonds this past year taking the leap. We've seen it with Muwasau kind of coming into his own. Give me your take on Ken Norton Jr. because I want to keep him around as long as we can. I just don't know if it's the defensive coordinator spot, Matt. Well, you know, you you said it best there in the regard that Ken Norton Jr. I want Ken Norton Jr. as the linebacker coach for the next 10 to 15 years at UCLA. The the all-time great Bruin player on those great Cowboy teams with Jimmy Johnson and goes to the Niners, only guy with three consecutive Super Bowls, one, he's a legend, then obviously goes to USC in the height of the Pete Carroll era. You mentioned the the great 08 year of USC with Cushing and Mauluga and Matthews and so forth. And then obviously that, the, that those great Legion of Boom teams with, with Wagner, et cetera, as you laid out, and then the Renaissance with Khalil Mack. To me, Ken Norton Jr. is taking on two roles at UCLA. And those are roles that will stand the test of time. I want those to be decade-long roles. A, to be this incredible linebacker coach, this positional coach. But B, he's almost, he's almost the ambassador of the football program from a recruiting standpoint. And so those are his two hats. And he plays them so beautifully. And nobody else within the UCLA ecosystem can play them as well. And that's where you really want to maximize his ability. I think that Ken Norton Jr. has a little bit of an Eric Bieniemy type of mm -hmm. reputation when it comes to being a, lar you know, a larger, greater scoped coach, right? What's the, what is this mystery with Eric Bieniemy? I think a lot of it, without getting into the race side of things, which is hugely important, but just sticking to football, I think the concern with the enemy is how much is it that he's calling the plays and architecting the offense and how much of it is Andy Reid? And I think similarly with Ken Norton Jr., even with his time at USC and even with his time with the Seahawks, how much was he sort of architecting the defense and how much was it Pete Carroll, given that's Pete Carroll's bread and butter? So I think that that's where if you're going to give him that added scope, with that mystery, and then on top of that, still want him to be excellent as a positional coach and also be your ambassador from a recruiting standpoint, you're almost stretching him too thin, and he's not going to be able to do any one of those things well at all. And so to me, my preference is to keep him – I don't care who the defensive coordinator is. Ken Norton Jr. is not going anywhere as a linebacker's coach. That would be something I would say if I were Martin Jarman. That's off limits. You want to come and be – D coordinator at UCLA, by all means, you're not touching the linebackers coach because he's linebacker slash football ambassador recruiter. And we're not messing with that because he's a lifelong Bruin and you just can't teach that passion. So for me, that's why I would want to keep Ken Norton Jr. where he is. Now, again, similar situation. If you need a bridge for a year before the Big Ten money comes in, obviously he'll do it with his heart, but it's not a long term sustainable strategy. Yeah, I completely agree, but let's keep Ken here as long as we can. This guy is just – you've seen the transformation already. You've seen what he can do with linebacking rooms. That's his bread and butter. It's like, yeah, I, I, I can podcast, but it's like, do you guys want me to take over LAFB? No, I'd be terrible at it. 
I can podcast, but it's like stretching me too thin. You know what I mean? I, I feel like it's the same for Ken Norton Jr. moving forward. So those are the two guys that are on staff that I feel would be most likely to take in a, you know, an upgrade of a role, if you will, to the defensive coordinator spot. What's up, Bruin Bible listeners? This is your host, Will Decker. Wanted to bring you the sponsors for today's episode, Bet Online, where the gambling starts. I've got a bunch of good bets going on right now. I've got the Lakers making the playoffs. We've got futures bets coming around for MLB baseball. March Madness is around the corner. NBA playoffs on the horizon, too. Make sure to check out all of the gambling and all of your gambling needs at Bet Online, where the gambling starts. Make sure to use promo code LAFB to get a little discount. Uh, everything is great on Bet Online. I use it weekly for all my gambling needs. Make sure to check it out. LAFB gambling, and now to the Bruin Bible. SEC offers, and that's pretty much the list of recruits for UCLA. This is Will Decker, your host with Jamal Madney, who signed out. Uh, what an episode that was. Uh, make sure you are liking and subscribing the YouTube channel we've got with UCLA LAFB. It's going to be a fun year. We've got a special episode coming on Saturday uh, with one of the UCLA fans that we would love to talk to. I'll let you get to that when the episode comes out, but make sure you're tuning into all Bruin Bible stuff. Will Decker, your host, we are officially out. Now, this is where it gets interesting, Mad Men. I've got two names that I like that are currently free agents and two guys that are currently at jobs that I feel like can be easily pried away if the money and the situation is right. And for all you UCLA fans saying, hey, we don't pay our defensive coordinators we had the second highest salary of any defensive coordinator last year, McGovern, at 900000 Whether he deserved that or not, who knows? But we're willing to pony up for these guys. This administration has really, you know, put a preference on putting money first where it matters, and that's on the football field. Madman, the first guy I got for you, Gary Patterson, was an assistant to Texas. There's a lot of, you know, would this be a good fit? Would this be a bad fit? I'll start with why it's a good fit. Because Gary Patterson is a revolutionary defensive coach. And I know when people think of the TCU archetype and how that program has been built, you think of LaDainian Tomlinson, you think of Andy Dalton, you think of all these other teams. Gary Patterson's actually a defensive guy. And he has always outperformed defensively with the talent that is recruited consistently to TCU. And his magnum opus, if you will, was the 2010 season when they went to the Fiesta Bowl and they lost by a touchdown to the record-setting Kellen Moore in Boise State offense. It was a 17-10 game. He allowed the fewest yards in the entire country at TCU that year in a Big 12 program. When the likes of a Colt McCoy was there, a Sam Bradford was there, a Mike Leach raid offense was there. That might be the most impressive defensive stat I've ever seen, given what we know about the Big 12. Gary Patterson is a two-time national coach of the year in 2010 and 2014 if this guy is interested there is a way we can get him to campus it's going to take a bump up in the salary i think it would be a perfect fit but however i do think there's a couple areas for potentially not a good fit one i think he clearly likes to stay in the state of texas tcu was the job he had for 20 plus years got fired could have gone anywhere and he chose to go to texas he wants to stay in the state and two this guy's got to be considering head coaching jobs. So if we get Gary Patterson, it's for a short-term you know, prop, proposition, if you will. Give me your take on Gary Patterson, because if we can somehow lure him, and I'd give it you know, a 10% chance at best, if we could somehow lure Gary Patterson to Westwood, what does this mean for Bruin fans? Oh, my God, Will. I mean, this is my guy. And you know that this has been my guy for about a year and a half. You know, if we rewind 18 months, Will, and – we were having some, obviously, we're very pro-chip, but we were having some conversations. Hey, what if this this program moved on from chip? As you recall, we were having those conversations, you, me, and Ryan. And Gary Patterson was my first choice for head coach of, of UCLA way back when. So when you're asking me, should he be defensive coordinator? Uh, yes, you know, I mean, in that regard, when you when you look at, this man built TCU from scratch. I mean, when you talk about over 160 career wins, you're talking about five top 10 finishes, Will. 
You talk about that great 2010 team. They went to the Rose Bowl against Wisconsin one year with Dalton. You talked about the incredible defense that year when Colt McCoy, Sam Bradford, Graham Harrell was the quarterback at Texas Tech as well. I mean, you were, there were three record-setting offenses in the Big 12 that year, and he was able to essentially shut them down and do it at a place like TCU. So he's got the vision, he's got the discipline, he's got the long-term thinking, he understands defensive schematics, he gets the most out of his players. Just absolutely an incredible coach. And the way you potentially lure him in is you make him the highest paid coordinator in the country and, and essentially look at it from that perspective. I wonder how much energy Gary Patterson has left to be a head coach after 20 years or so at TCU and whether he would just welcome the opportunity to kind of slide back in in a D.C. capacity. I also think UCLA moving to the Big Ten helps. Granted, it's not the SEC, it's not the Texoma region, but at least he'll be closer to his home and not just be playing games all the way on the West Coast. And then you're talking about pairing the mind of Chip Kelly offensively with the mind of Gary Patterson defensively, and both of them having so much respect for one another that they wouldn't cross over and be like, you got the defense, I got the offense. It's almost a, a Mike Ditka, Buddy Ryan type of situation with the 85 Bears, you know, where you almost have two head coaches in a sense, and they're just kind of running their positions. It would be the dream scenario, Will, and it would be the scenario that gets UCLA to its absolute ceiling, in my mind, in terms of culture, coaching, and setting up the talent pipeline for on-the-field success. So Gary Patterson, to me, would be – the home run scenario outside of one other guy that we'll get to, I'm sure, next. But I can't think of more positive things to say about Gary Patterson. When you think of the annals of college football, Will, how many coaches can say that they took an, you know, they actually took an obscure team and actually turned them into a household brand name? I mean, you're talking about guys now like Bobby Bowden, Howard Schnellenberger. You know, with Miami, I, you know, folks that took non-traditional powers and actually made them into something. Gary Patterson is on that list. What was TCU football before Gary Patterson? How is TCU football a, a, a great football school? It, it, it's built on the back of Gary Patterson. Gary Patterson. So what you're saying is, is if he came to UCLA, Chip Kelly would be uh, Coach Boone from Remember the Titans. And, you know, uh Patterson would be the coach Yost. Yes. That would be the way it would work. That would be the way it would work. Oh, I love it. Thriller. You know, Thriller is gutting it out. This is like the MJ flu game with Thriller. You know, the eye is thin. The throat is hurting. And then he still finds a way to dig deep to give me a remember the Titans analogy. I mean, that's that's how you make the Hall of Fame right there, ladies and gentlemen. That's why Will Decker is Will Decker. Man, well, appreciate it. I'm gutting it out for these Bruin fans, man, because that's what we care about here at LA Football Network. Gary Patterson, I, I think it's less than a 10% chance, but that needs to be explored. We're clearly willing to spend the money. It's whether he wants to leave Texas or he wants to take a head coaching job. That's where I think it's at. The next guy that you alluded to in the last question, a free agent, and maybe the greatest free agent in all of college football when it comes to coordinators. Very unlikely, maybe more unlikely than Patterson, Jim Leonard, formerly from Wisconsin. And, you know, Big Ten country, I think one of the reasons he really excelled and coached well at Wisconsin was that was his alma mater. That's what he cared about, you know. So he is out there. I think he's trying to figure out his next step in the coaching realm. But if this guy is available, this would be an absolute home run for the team that plays in the Rose Bowl week in and week out. And let me tell you what Jim Leonard brought. So Jim Leonard actually replaced Justin Wilcox, who became the Cal head coach in 2017. From 2019 to 2021, Wisconsin's defense is ranked fourth, fourth, and number one in total defense from that span in the entire NCAA. This guy is as good as a defensive coordinator as you're going to find on the college level. Uh, you watch those Wisconsin defenses, those Leo Chanals that we scouted for in the past. They're fast, they're furious, they're sound. They swarm the ball. I mean, it's, it's so hard moving the football on a Wisconsin Jim Leonard-led team that this guy is going to be the top of the you know candidate for any team that has any money to spend on the defensive coordinator side. So would we love him? Of course. What I am worried about is I'm worried about some of these SEC schools 
where the only thing that matters in life is football coming there. Maybe even USC, if this Grinch thing continually, you know, goes awry for them. So what I would say is, is if Jim Leonard is willing to take it, we've got to act fast. We've got to try to pounce on him now. If not, we could see him at LSU next year. We could see him even taking over a head coaching job, given for how good of a job he did as a DC at Wisconsin. Madman, give me your take on Jim Leonard because this guy, I mean, he's like the can't-miss prospect of the defensive coordinators. Well, this is the number one guy on the board here, you know, for everyone. And I love Patterson, and but but Leonard is kind of the number one guy on the board given his youth, uh, how he is relatable to the modern player, and just everything he was able to do in such a short period of time. To me, though, this is a bit of a reach for UCLA if we're being completely objective. One of the interesting things, Will, was there was a lot of conversation about Jim Leonard potentially taking over for defensive coordinator of the Rams in the event that Raheem Morris chose to move on and and get a head coaching possibility. That is how highly Jim Leonard is thought of in not only college circles, but in NFL circles. And so now he gets the opportunity to take a step back. Obviously, Luke Fickle took that Wisconsin job. He, he was offered the role to stay on. He chose to step back and say, listen, this is now a new era, a, a new staff coming in. I want to kind of survey my options. I know the University of Miami is being very aggressive in trying to pursue him. I would imagine they would break the bank on the order of several million dollars to pay him to, to be defensive coordinator of the University of Miami. I think he wants to see how some of these stabs fill out potentially in the NFL. And then I think he wants to see what's happening in SEC country. So to me, I think he's thinking about now the trajectory of his career. He's proven to be, if not the best defensive mind in college football right now, certainly in the top three to five. And so now I think he wants to make that jump to say, do I go to the SEC to be a defensive coordinator? Do I go to the NFL? Does that opportunity present itself? Or is there an opportunity for a power five or even a non-power five school to now become head coach? So I think that's kind of where his headset is. I don't know truthfully how much it makes sense for his career, given that growth trajectory to say, I'm going to go from defensive coordinator of Wisconsin the defensive coordinator of UCLA. And so truth be told there, that feels like a lateral move at best, especially from a defensive side of the ball. So it's, I mean, we can all dream and that's what we need to do as fans. He would be just the absolute honeymoon scenario. It wouldn't put UCLA in ultimate contention right away, not just for the conference, but even in terms of CFP next year, when it goes to 12 teams, but I think this one's a little bit of a pipe dream. I think 10% is also a little bit sporty. I think this is kind of in that 1% to 3% range of, of possibility. Oh, yeah. No, I'm in the same boat. All I'm saying is this has to be evaluated. If he's Absolutely. No doubt. you got to ring the phone at least, see what he's looking for. And to the credit of that, like, who says he's not the Eagles coordinator? I mean, Jonathan Gannon just took a head coaching job elsewhere. Exactly. So, exactly. You know, he could be taking the job in Philly. He could be taking the job at University of Miami. This guy Absolutely. could be going to a variety of different places. So Jim Leonard to the top of everyone's wish list. We got to include the Bruins there. Never say never. I mean, we got a guy yeah. in Dante Moore who is a pipe dream as well. So you never know what can potentially happen. Chip Kelly, you know, he may sway what our guy Jim Leonard is thinking right now. So, those are the two Yo, guys. Are you, gonna, are you gonna are you gonna take the the reins from Jacob Emrani when it was 2018 when LeBron was supposed to be here and then he he came up with the hashtag Labron L A Bron. So are you gonna come up with the hashtag Leonard instead of Leonard L A N E O R D for for <laughs> our boy Jim Leonard? <laughs> Leonard to L A man. Leonard to L A. We'll make that happen, bro. I think it's gonna be really good. Uh, we got to at least put the pitch out. Maybe we can get some billboards with some LAFP yeah. funding. We'll have to see what we can do with that. Uh, so Jim Leonard's the other guy I was thinking of, man, when it came to that. I've got two other guys that I feel are currently in coordinator spots where it, it, it hypothetically makes sense if they came to UCLA. It would be an upgrade for both of them at the position. And the guy I want to start with is a team that we play next year. Uh, we play the San Diego State Aztecs. Second game of the season. You and I are going to be going down to that game, I take it. We're going to be taking the freeway down to San Diego, trying to spend a nice weekend down there, go watch our Bruins hopefully beat up on the likes of the Aztecs. 
But this guy, Kurt Maddox, is a sleeper of a defensive coordinator, you know, prospect. And he's already pretty much in UCLA's backyard. If he were to take a natural progression for what he's doing at San Diego State and take the job forward. I look at what this guy has done. And in the past two years, San Diego State, under this guy's tutelage, Kurt Maddox, uh, is finished top 20 in scoring defense at 11th and 17th, respectively. And last year as a whole, it was very impressive what he did. They finished third in the entire country in rushing yards allowed per game at 83 yards. Um, they finished fifth in the entire country in total team interceptions and 12th in total defense and 13th in pass efficiency defense. You know me. I'm a guy, when I hear good stats about the pass defense, my ears perk up because that's exactly what UCLA's Achilles heel has been. As you know, 10 times over was speaking with me. Kurt Maddox is a guy that I just feel laterally – you know, would make so much sense. He's right here. He's already in California. You can give him a raise. We've seen the track record. He's done really good things in multiple seasons now for San Diego State. Give me your initial take on Kurt Maddox, because I think this guy could be a potential really good hire for UCLA if given the opportunity. No doubt, Will. I really like this one. I really like this category, because I like this guy as well as the next guy that we're talking about. Maddox, what I really love is how he sort of worked his way up and Chip has a tendency to really like the guys that are sort of flying under the radar, the non-Power 5 guys. And if you recall, Will, he, much like Chip, also has an FCS background. And it was through the FCS that he came up to San Diego State and made that happen. So there's a lot of alignment there in terms of his career progression with that of Chip. I think personality-wise, they're similar. And then you talked about it, Will. The, ge the geographic element and the fact that Maddox can bring that credibility from this part of the country into UCLA now with that enhanced brand, those enhanced resources, it's a huge deal to be able to further solidify your recruiting pipeline and really establish pockets of excellence. We've talked so much about St. John's Bosco. We've talked so much about other schools over the course of the last several months bring a guy like Maddox who already has familiarity with not just LA County, not just with Orange County, but now San Diego County. Those three counties go hand in hand in terms of this elite talent pipeline. So Maddox just makes a lot of sense, not in just in terms of his on the field performance, which has been terrific top 20, the last two years, like you talked about, but also from a strategic standpoint of talent acquisition. And then also that alignment piece culturally, because he comes from, Similar background as Chip through FCS, smaller school guy. He's going to get the values of UCLA very clearly. He's coming from a public school, a Cal State system, and understands some of those political dynamics that the UC system has. So it really fits on a lot of levels where Maddox can be a long-term solution for UCLA for many years to come. And you know Chip is a big stability guy. So it'll involve Chip kind of going outside of his inner circle but this guy can very quickly become a member of Chip's inner circle. And also the on-field production is absolutely terrific. He's being groomed by a guy in Brady Hoke that was a head coach at Michigan for a lot of years. And this is kind of his star pupil, if you will, at San Diego yeah. State. So he's prepping him for the bigger jobs, the bigger limelight. He came from Eastern Kentucky. He came from San Diego State. He surpassed the expectations at both areas. The only way is up for him is, and if San, if San Diego State, you know, if they're willing to maybe, you know, do some things, he might even be better this year than he was last year. Yeah. So if he continually shows that progression, why wouldn't UCLA reach out, at least if they have that vacant coordinator position? So I really, really like Kurt Maddox, and maybe he can strengthen ties for us in San Diego when it comes to recruiting as well. The other guy I got for you, Madman, the last guy that we're going to talk about, Tim DeRoyder. Uh, this guy is a California guy. I like that. He's originally from Long Beach, went and coached at Fresno State. He was a defensive coordinator at Cal for a couple of years, was the D.C. for Mario Crystal Ball in 2021 until he left for Miami. So a lot of West Coast ties. He clearly would like to coach on the West Coast in some capacity. And the thing that I like about this guy is when you look at the track records of the teams that he's inherited and what they've done defensively, he gets you from point A to point B. He is yeah. like a very reliable Toyota Camry. And we have the numbers to back that up. So the early 2000s, his first D.C. job, it was with, you know, Ohio University. So Ohio University took them from 99th in total defense to 22nd by his second year. When he went to Nevada, 
we saw the, the numbers jump up from there. 78 to 48. When he went to Cal, he went from 79th to 22nd, you know, and in the late 2000s. He made, you know, Cal's defense under Wilcox one of the better units within the Pac-12 for a little while there. And then you see what he did at Texas A&M when he was in a, the head coach assistant to Mike Sherman at the time. They were 104th in scoring defense before he got there. He took them to 10th in the entire country by the time he left. So you have all of this track record of him dramatically improving situations upon arriving. So Tim DeRoyter, for just being a great defensive coordinator as it is, for having ties to California at multiple stops, for being originally from Long Beach, I think this is a very good fit if things were to go right. He's currently at Texas Tech. We'd have to work out something there. But I can tell you, L.A. is a lot more attractive place than Lubbock, Texas, if you're going to be coaching. Give me your thoughts on DeRoyter because this guy might even be a better fit the Maddox at the end of the day. Well, uh, absolutely. And I love how you said that LA is a much more attractive place than, than <laughs> Lubbock, Texas. My wife's best friend, uh, you know, co-maid of honor at our wedding, at, you know, for, for my wife uh, was originally from Lubbock, Texas. And, and I think she would agree uh, vehemently. She now, uh, you know, was living in San Francisco and, and has moved around a little bit, but yes, LA is better than Lubbock, Texas. That's for sure. Um, but what I love about the Reuter will in terms of fit, is you said it best, it may be an even better fit than Maddox because I want to double click on the specific experience that he had at Cal. When you look at those those years and when you look at the team that he inherited and they were roughly 125th in total defense when he had inherited them. And then the next four years, they were anywhere between 33rd and 60th, he sort of averaged them out to be a t you know a top 50 defense. And where is that sort of ringing bells? How many times have you and I said if we can just take this defense out of the triple digits, out of the the low 90s, the low 80s, and move them to the 40s and 50s? You're talking about a team that has a legitimate shot at a national championship. I mean, that's that's not hyperbole. And so when you look at what DeRoyter did, exactly that same scenario of taking a team in the, in the triple figures and then moving them into top 50, same type of school, same type of GPA requirements, and was able to do the same type of thing. So when you talk about normalizing the data, when you talk about aligning experiences, because that's always the hard part with these jobs. Well, you did it at place A under situation B with resources C. And now can you do it here? Because we're so different for X, Y, and Z reasons. Well, guess what? DeRoyter did it in a circumstance, in a place that is as similar to UCLA as you can possibly get and was proven to be successful. And so that's why I really love DeRoyter. I mean, I, I love DeRoyter even more than Maddox because it's just been so proven in such a similar situation. But both of those guys would be exceptional. But DeRoyter is someone that is really flying under the radar right now. And I think that would be a welcome shift and, and really a tectonic shift under the radar, which is what Chip loves so much. Yeah. And I mean, it's one thing if you do it at one or two schools and then you fail everywhere yeah. else. This guy has a track record of succeeding everywhere he's gone. Yes. And I mean, to make that Cal defense what it was, with how the recruiting has really trended with a exactly. guy like Justin Wilcox, that's what it's what's impressive to me. Doing that at a University of Ohio, doing that at a University of Nevada, making these top twenty-five defenses in the entire country. I mean, that's all you can ask for. I mean, that's yes. more. You know, it's incredible what he's done. So Tim DeRoyter uh, and Kurt Maddox are my two guys that I'm really stoked about. If we are to get you know open that position up next year and maybe kind of you know throw them the invite to see if they're interested. Madman, did we miss any names in the defensive coordinator spot? I talked about Jimmy Lake, you know, David Shaw, you know, his son is a walk on here. He's more of an offensive minded guy. So I don't think it would be a great fit. Did we miss anybody? Thriller, this was such a great list. There's one name that sort of is in the back of my mind as well. That's also a little bit under the radar right now. Jeremy Pruitt. Jeremy mm -hmm. Pruitt, five time national champion as a defensive coordinator, Alabama, Georgia. Florida State. Obviously, things did not work out as a head coach at Tennessee. And then obviously, Josh Heupel has been able to take that team and elevate them to the next level. He's kind of just floating around, you know, in purgatory right now. And he's sort of been the forgotten guy. And I, I think that he's got very strong SEC and Southern roots. He's trying to work his way back in. But 
I think a, a play for Pruitt is potentially to say, if I ultimately want to go back to the SEC, maybe I need to reprove myself as a great defensive coordinator elsewhere. He's got an, inc- I mean, all you got to do is sort of flash the rings, right? Well, it's like the, the, the old Pat Riley trick when he was recruiting the Heatles. He just took his bag and laid out the rings and said, here you go in terms of what, that's my resume, you know? And so Pruitt can do a very similar thing in terms of recruiting on the West Coast with guys, a fresh set of talent, a new brand, and be able to really revive himself as a very seismic, incredible name from a defensive perspective in the college football landscape that could then set him up again. So Pruitt is one guy I always have in the back of my mind, Will, that's really worth looking at and seeing if there's a there there. I love it, man. I mean, you mentioned what he brings to the table. Multiple successful defenses has worked with Nick Saban's in the Georgias of the world. Like this guy has the talent. The thing that I'm worried about is taking a Southern man and putting him in Los Angeles, California. <laughs> like this guy is like born and bred Alabama. Yeah. Do you yeah. remember that high school show on uh, MTV it was Hoover yeah. high school. Yeah, he Hoover was high school. Coach at Hoover before he went to Alabama. Yeah. This man is like from Bama, Bama. Like this is not, you know, a guy from New York city that wanted to coach or Chicago. I would be worried about that aspect, but hey, if he is willing to come to LA, we will pay the way for our guy. And to our credit, we said he's from the South. He did take a job as a special assistant for the New York Giants yep. last year. So he he has shown some willingness to move to a bigger market and kind of learn a little bit. So I think for all purposes, this could be a really good pickup for us, man. So Jeremy Pruitt's got to be a name listed. Madman, thank you so much for coming on again, dude. Like, this is always a blast talking with you guys. Guys, I know it's probably going to drive you crazy. I was sick. I've got a sniffle. You know, I've got my eye looking really messed up. But I gutted it out for you Bruin fans. We love you guys. Very, very special guest coming on the pod next week. Not going to say who it is, but it's the biggest guest we've had. Former Bruin player. You guys are going to freak when you figure out who this is. Madman's going to be joining me for that interview, so stay attention for that. We're going to be talking cars. If that's a hint for any of you guys out there, that's that's what we're going to be talking about when he comes on. And just uh, to be clear, vroom, vroom, not Derek and David, you know, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're not going to be talking about yeah. Derek Carr moving, you know, from the Raiders. This guy is just a fan of automobiles and cars as a whole. We're going to be talking about that. But former Bruin player, currently in the NFL. Keep an eye out for that. Madman, any parting thoughts for this fun coaching activity? Brother, what a great conversation here. I think it was the richest defensive coordinator conversation that we've had in quite some time. And just always so grateful to you to be able to gut this out tonight. And Bruin family loves you so much. And, you know, you reciprocate that love. I know you're nowhere close to 100%. You're probably at 10 to 20% right now. And the fact that you were able to gut this out with the depth of analysis, with the personality that you always bring, I know how much I appreciate you, and I know how much our fans do as well. So thank you for allowing us to have this conversation tonight. Well, in the great words of Michael Scott, I know you are, but what am I? Uh, Great talking to you, my man. We are out, Bruin Bible. Stay tuned for the biggest episode we've had in a long time coming up this week.